Hi, it's time for another math easy solution. Turn to discuss further into applications of integrals, and now look at uh, application where it deals with blood flow and go over. I think it's how you pronounce uh, Poiseuille's law. I'm not sure how to pronounce it perfectly. I'll just go with Poiseuille's law. Uh, basically, going further in my earlier video, I went over uh, application of derivatives uh, and I went over blood flow and I went over the law of laminar flow, which I I uh, explained that it was this one, the sort of velocity V of R inside a tube, and I'll draw it out in a bit, is equal to uh, delta P, which is basically the uh, pre pressure difference between two ends of the vessel, or in this case a blood vessel or any pipe, divided by four times this eta, that's a symbol eta. I'll go over this for this dynamic or shear viscosity of the blood. So here we're dealing with blood flow, and then this is the radius of the blood vessel squared minus the radius from the center and this is when you look at the velocity and again where V is the velocity of the blood that flows along a blood vessel R is the radius of the blood vessel, L is the length of the blood vessel this is the pressure difference between the ends of the vessel and I'll draw that out in a bit and this is the dynamic or shear viscosity of the blood this is the eta, or this is the Greek letter eta, and then the viscosity of the fluid is measured of its resistance to gradual deformation by shearing, uh, by shear as in tearing it, like just tearing it side to side or whatnot, or tensile pulling stresses. The SI, or the standard international units, or uh, pascals times seconds. And basically, the fluid is placed between two plates with a distance one meter. So if you had a, two plates like this, so the distance one meter and you had a, a fluid inside here and one plate is pushed sideways with a shear stress of so you push it all the way to the right this is of one pascal and it moves at let's say x meters per second so this is this plate is moving at x meters per second x uh, and meters per second and again, this is the difference uh, between here, so it's one meter. So it's distance one meter across. Then uh, basically its viscosity is one divided by uh, x, and its units are pascal seconds. And the reason, like this one here, if you had something like super thick, like honey right here, this wouldn't move that much. So in that case, the velocity would be slow, and since you're, since you're dividing by the velocity, it's going to be a really high number, but if you had water, it's going to go really, really fast. You just push it. Yeah, so again, to get the units, it's going to be so that eta, or the dynamic viscosity, is going to be 1 pascal times it by the default 1 meter, and then we divide this by x, which is in x meters per second. So we get this uh, 1 over x, and the units, the seconds go on top, the meters cancel we're just left with this and that's going to be pascal seconds. The units are pascal dot second like that. That's one, uh, yes that's over here, pascal second or units of this. Uh, anyways, uh, basically an example like I explained earlier was just again honey has a much higher viscosity of water because well this wouldn't move and it's, it's really sticky and water is just really fluid. And viscosity is measured using various types of viscometers and rheometers. I'm not going to get into those. I just want to get to detail on viscosity right here just to explain a bit more. And a fluid with zero uh, viscosity, this is pretty interesting, is an ideal fluid that has no resistance to shearing. And this is only observed at very low temperatures in superfluids. And superfluidity is a state of matter in which the matter behaves like a fluid with zero viscosity and these superfluids appear to self-propel because nothing is holding them back and travel in a way that seems to defy all forces of gravity and surface tension and superfluids are found in astrophysics which is a study of nature of matter in space not and not necessarily the where planets are in space but how they behave and uh, other other stuff like that and also in high energy physics and theories of quantum gravity I'm not gonna Go in detail of that, so just uh, just, just some inter interesting notes on viscosity. And again, going back to this equation, oh, this is for the law of laminar flow. Just to recap from my earlier video, so if you have a, a tube, or in our case a blood vessel, doesn't matter if it's any kind of tube, so let's say it's like this, I'll just cut it like that. Draw this in 3D. So the pressure difference, let's say this is P1, this is P2. 
So this delta P right here is just P2 minus P1. That's the pressure difference. Now let's go delta P equals to P2 minus P1. That's all it is if you have the pressure uh, pushing against the fluid here and versus over here. And again, the radius of this vessel is R. The full length here is because yeah, the full length where you know the pressure differences are going to be L like that. And if and then the axis here, if we draw this center line of this circular vessel like that, this is the central axis. And the small r where we're finding the velocity, etc., it's from the center line. We'll draw this like that and I call that r so at any point inside here, a uh, maximum is capital R there. And now the blood here, if you were to look at a, in, a cross section like this, I'll draw this in red. So this is just a random cross section and the idea is because there's wall friction on these walls, the fastest uh, the velocity of, it, of the uh, blood or any fluid is going to be at the center. So if these are the velocity, it'll look something like this. So you have the highest velocity at the top and then smaller and smaller and then you have a part where it's not moving much or not at all at near the walls and let's write that down here. So again higher velocities near the center. Yeah because of uh, yeah, because of less resistance right here, less resistance. Yeah, so near the center you're gonna have higher velocity. There's less resistance from the walls. It's really far away, so it's not gonna affect too much from the center. From from the walls due to friction. And yeah, you can see this in this equation here, as you, this R gets bigger, well, you're gonna get, it's gonna be your subtracting here, so if it's at the wall, it's in theory, it's not moving, so it's zero, because it's touching the wall, and then as further away from the wall, then you're gonna have it uh, l less affected, where this R radius becomes, well, zero, so it's not gonna be affecting uh, the velocity too much. Yeah, and now, in order to compute the rate of blood or flux, yeah, actually, or more commonly used volumetric flow rate, or pretty much the volume that it's moving per unit time per second, or whatever uh, time unit you have, again, volume per unit time. What we'll do is consider the smaller equally spaced radii or radiuses, uh, however you like to say it, R1, R2, R1. So again, Poisson's law, what we're going to try to do in this one, what the, the that physicist actually did was, derive it so that we, this is a velocity here, we're going to try to get a volumetric flow rate or the how much of the fluid is traveling per time and not necessarily how fast we're going. So to do that again we'll look at a cross section so what we'll do, let's just draw this tube like this so we have this tube so if we take the cross section like that and then what we have is this circle let's draw this like that so we take this cross section and then look at it. Let's draw this a bit neater, like just like that. So if we bring this over and just draw it really big, so we have a circle like that. Let's draw this one more time. Okay, that's good enough. Yeah, now this circle right here has a radius like this, which is capital R. And now what we're going to be doing is, as explained here, we're going to look at Again, like always with integration, we're going to consider smaller equally spaced interval. In this case, it's radiuses R1, R2. So, for example, the R1 would be something, let's say, like this. And then R2 would be like this. And these are equally spaced, like that. And then basically all the way to Rn. Rn would be, well, the farthest one out here. That's just going to be our Rn is evenly width. So let's just draw this something like that and this is uh this circle is not the scale it's just a bit deformed but anyway so this is going to be our r n and and now it just to draw again like always you would draw let's say a generic one inside let's say that we just have a random one like that so for a generic one we'll call this so let's draw this one more time around it 
so we have a shape like that I'll highlight this one, we're going to be dealing with this one and now the distance from here to here, we'll just call this generically RI and then the distance from there to this part of the inside of it that's going to be our RI minus 1 and again these are all equally spaced, we'll just call this delta x, these are all delta x, so it's all the exact same like that, this is going to be also delta x. Yeah, and now the area of the ring or washer here with inner radius ri minus 1 and an outer radius ri, so again a generic one, we'll call this ai, just for that area, so the area is going to be, well, it's going to, just going to be the full circle minus the inner circle, so this is just going to be par I mean pi r i squared minus pi and then r i this is going to be minus one this is squared and then what we'll do here actually is just to make it just easier to evaluate um, we'll, we could write it like this pi and then just factor out the pi so we have r i squared minus r i minus one here squared and now what we can notice here is because of these are squared and as a subtraction you can actually write these as simply pi and then this is going to be ri squared, I mean this ri plus ri minus 1 multiplied by ri minus ri minus 1 for example and again you could use you know, actually I just wrote this in black, I don't know why I was in red okay so anyways the reason we could do this is well, if we look at something, let's a minus b, um, let's just go a minus b times by a plus b as this case, when you expand this out or foil it out, what we end up getting is, well, this times this times this, this, and then times by that we add it. So we get this a squared, and then we'll have a b, then here we're going to have a negative a b, and then a negative b squared, so these cancel, we're just left with a squared minus b squared. So that's why we could write it like that, and I forgot what this was called, something conjugate or perfect square or something like that. Anyways, so that we have this, yeah, we could use the fact that, well, the average, if we call ri like that with the line above as r average, and again, you know, the average is just going to be, you add them up and divide by 2, or the number of them, so this, by that, divide by 2. So what we could do is write this as 2ri. So basically, yeah, basically over here we could solve ri, this one, we'll just put a 2 here, equals to ri plus ri minus 1. And now we could throw this inside here. So what we end up getting now is a i equals two. So now we'll have is del uh, this is going to be pi. We're going to actually have two pi and then this r i center or average. And then what we're going to do is write delta r, which is well the difference r i minus r i minus one. Where in this case um, delta r is simply r i minus r i minus 1 and our r average again like I explained above is r i just for completeness write it down again divided by 2 like that and now if you look at this visually where that center line is and actually I just made a mistake here these are delta r's not delta x yeah the, we're using the r variable in our case instead of r so anyways that's delta r we didn't come didn't provide too much confusion. This is delta R as well. Yeah, let's draw this again. And yeah, again, visually the RI average is going to be well up to the center of this. Draw it like that. This is our RI center line or average. So we're just going to be dealing with this instead, just to be more uh, exact. And now what we're going to do is actually just consider that if delta r, or the interval we're looking at, is really, really, really small, then the velocity is almost constant throughout this ring, because again, remember that the velocity increases as you get closer to the center, but we're going to assume that it's really small, and just assume that the top and bottom, or I mean the closer and farther away radius is, like from here to, or here, it's all going to be the same, so across this whole thing, 
we'll assume that the blood is moving at the exact same velocity just just for uh, this derivation and again when you go infinitely small it does actually it's pretty much the same when you take a limit they are the same then the velocity again is almost constant throughout this ring and we'll just approximate that velocity across the whole thing as V and then put the RI center line. Thus the volume per unit time, we'll call this Q, uh, QI that flows across that ring, that individual ring is going to be well QI which is a volume I divided by the time. Yeah, this is the time or or these are pretty much the units and then what we're going to have is actually we're going to have, so to get this it's going to be that area so when we have this area and then we multiply it yeah, by the velocity so VI, I mean I'll just call this V of RI center line so this would be the volume per unit time for example let's say you had um, let's say you had a ring like this and this was, you know, so, so let's say this area has one. So this area equals to one. And if this whole area is one and it travels, the blood is traveling at one meter per second, then the total volume that we'll have, if you draw this in 3D, we'll have actually in one second, we will get actually a volume. That's, that's why that's the uh, equation for the volume rate. So we'll have like this. So this shape will actually look like this. So we get a volume across because this is in one second. That's how far it travels, that's how much blood goes through in that one second. So you could think of it as, and this is one meter per second, so this is a distance of one meter. And this is, let's say, one meter. Area is equal to one. And again, the volume would be just equal to one meter times um, this is uh, actually this is area. This is one meter squared. That's area. The units for area is meter squared. So we have one meter squared times one meter. So we'll have one meter cubed of volume going across. So that's how you to kind of think about it. And now in our case, our QI or the volumetric flow rate is going to be. This is going to be two pi r i center line. And then again, let's just see that that was this again. That's the area times by delta r times and now by v velocity I, that we're assuming across the whole thing. Yeah, across the whole ring. So now this one, let's write this a bit neater. It's two r i v r i center line then delta r. Yeah. Now the total volume that flows across a cross section per unit time is approximately. And again, we're going to take a summation so the full volumetric flow rate of Q is going to be the summation of all of our sub intervals or sub interval rings I equals 1 up to n of of now we're going to have this that volumetric for that one ring 2 pi ri like that v ri so that's the velocity and then we have the delta r and again yeah, again, when we look at this visually, what this means, and using the fact that the velocity is higher near the center of the ring, so, and again, after a certain time period, we're going to have, let's say, at the interval at the near the end of it, we're going to have something that looks like this. I'll draw it like that. And this will look more, this will make more sense as I get through the drawing. So that's the first volume across. Then we're going to have a more steep, I mean, more longer, uh, a longer shape like this because it's faster in that in that one second or one unit of time. We have more blood going through uh, near the center, so it's going to look something like this. And then finally, let's just draw one more. It's going to look something like that. So this is in 3D across the whole, and these are not stacking. This is assume it's going through the whole thing at the bottom, etc. Let's draw this like that. Uh, just, just, just to show that it's going the whole way across. Like that. Actually, this was a bit less accurate. So yeah, just look something like that. And here, just to show that this is going the whole way. So after the one unit of time, the center line, you can have a really long uh, shape like that of how much blood is going across it has a faster volumetric flow rate or there's blood moving at a faster rate so this 
complete the 3D drawing. It looks something like that, which is pretty interesting. And again here, higher velocity is causing this longer tube in there, so higher velocity. And now notice that the velocity and hence the volume per unit time increases toward the center of the blood vessel again as I explained in his drawing. And this approximation like always with, with integration integrals gets better as you increase n at again increasingly smaller uh, interval uh, length or delta r's. So and then when we take the limit to infinity we get the exact, the exact value of the volumetric flow rate q also known as yeah, as flux, again, like I explained before, or discharge, which is the volume of blood that passes a cross-section per unit time. And again, this, since this is the exact value, so I'm going to go back up to here. This is approximately, so you don't use the equal sign, you use the approximate equal sign. So what we get is Q is going to equal when we take the limit as n approaches infinity of this summation of uh, and I mean I equals 1 up to n of 2 pi this is the volume uh, per unit time across that one ring and then when we sum it up to infinite number of rings delta R this is just a Raymond sum like I always explain it with integral videos and then this is gonna be you could write this as an integral from integral from 0 to r of 2 pi r and then yeah again we're going to just use r because when this is infinitely you know when you, when this is infinitely small delta r the ri and ri minus 1 and everything in between including this average r all coincide to be the exact same value because it's really really small so they're going to be pretty much the same and we'll just call that r like always and then so we're just going to be doing, then this is going to be as well vr and then this is infinitely small becomes dr so and now we can just plug in our law of laminar flow for the velocity and let's just go back up here which one that was all the way back to the very beginning vr equals delta p divided by 4 the viscosity a dot l length and then r squared minus little r squared let's go all the way back here this is going to be now 0 to r 2 pi r and then this is gonna be if I remember correctly this is delta p over 4 eta l and then this is gonna be r squared minus r squared dr now this function, the only thing that's changing is this this uh, r values, we're assuming everything else is not changing, so we could take the constant values all out. This is going to be, well this cancels, this is going to be 2, so we get delta p, uh, delta p times, let's put the pi in front, so pi times delta p, and then this is 2 viscosity, and then l, integral from 0 to r of r squared minus r actually I forgot this uh, r right here so we multiply it so we get an r and well, I'll put the r back because it's it's the one that's changing that's constant r squared and this is r cubed so r times r squared dr and then just evaluate it we get this delta p 2 l and then this is going to be and again again it's zero to r because the uh, we start off at the origin or the center line where radius is zero all the way to the full radius of the vessel blood vessel or any tube so when you evaluate this we get r squared over two this is an r squared minus this is r four over four and we're integrating from zero to four when then and then i mean zero to r not four I just got mixed up because i wrote a four right there like this, like that. So when you plug in the four, the r, when we, then when you subtract, we put in the zero, but the zero it just becomes zero, so we can ignore that. So we get delta p. This is just tedious stuff, but we're almost there. And l, and then we have r cubed. So now this is r. This is a squared. So r squared times squared. That's r to the power of four. What by two? And then this one put the r four over four. Subtract when we put in zero, it just that's all zero. 
And then look at the common denominator here, times it by two, times it by two, so not changing anything, so we have a four there. And then two r four minus r, that's just, well, that's just one r to the power of four. And then so what we end up having is delta p, I'll just write that for completeness sake, l two r four minus r four, all over four, so the two times four goes to eight, and what we end up having is q is equal to pi delta p, and this is gonna be eight viscosity times l, and then that's just r four, like that. And I'll just circle this like that, and that is the equation for volumetric flow rate in a tube. Yeah, and this equation is called Poiseuille's law, and it, and it shows that the volume, the flow rate is proportional to the fourth power of the radius of the blood vessel or any other fluid-filled tube. And uh, this equation is not accurate. Um, and again, some notes on it. This equation is not accurate to when it's when it's close to the vessel or piping entrance because it's going to be more turbulent. That's a term used whenever you have a fluid just all over the place. Anyways, the equation fails in very low viscosity, well, uh, yeah, like something less than water, for example, wide and or short pipes. And so, for, so when you have low viscosity or really um, quick moving uh, fluid or a wide pipe, this may result in the turbulent flow, making it necessary to use more complex models, such as the darcy Whiteback equation. In fact, something interesting about um, turbulent flow yeah, with turbulent flow, even including, uh, let's say, yeah, let's say f uh, flow of air, which is also can be considered uh, somewhat like a fluid across the wings, etc. You have a lot of turbulent air building up in the back of the wings, and there's actually like a lot of uh, supercomputer power has to go into solving these highly complex uh, turbulent flow uh, models and other stuff like that. Anyways, short pipes, uh, this doesn't work for short pipes because this may result in unphysically high flow rates calculated by Poiseuille's law. There's other requirements on it, especially it has to be laminar flow, which is just smooth, uh, just smooth flow without too much turbulence. And now an interesting history, a little lesson on Poiseuille's law. Uh, first of all, this Poiseuille's law is also referred to as the hagen poiseuille equation because, well, uh, it was also in experimentally derived independently by both uh, Gotel of Heinrich Ludwig Hagen, it's a long name, in 1839, and Jean-Leonard Marie Poiseuille in 1838. Yeah, which is pretty much just roughly the same time, maybe a bit earlier than this, this one, and published by Poiseuille in the papers uh, in 1840 and 1846. And uh, some notes on Hagen, he lived from 1797 to 1884 and was a German civil engineer who made important contributions to fluid dynamics, hydraulic engineering and probability theory, so you should read up on him. And in 1839 he undertook careful experiments in brass tubes that enabled him to discover the relationship between the pressure drop or pressure difference and the tube diameter. So in his, uh, in his work, in his experiments, he showed that the pressure is proportional to 1 over the radius to power of 4.12. So this was an experimentally derived number as opposed to ours, which was just solved um, uh, using integrals like that and using the velocity you determined earlier. And this is going to be, again, this symbol here is proportional to, or like proportional it doesn't mean it equals it, it just means it's going to be a formula that includes something like that. And so when we look at R's here, this one, well you could just rewrite delta P equals 2. So this equals 2, when you move the R4 underneath, we're going to have Q, put the, just move everything, move this to top, move this to bottom, shift everything so we have delta P. 8 and L, then we have like this, that's Q, so now we have pi and then uh, R4. So this is proportional uh, to R to the power of 4. And Hagen uh, derived it up to, uh, he, he used experiments to show that as R4.12, but was 
What what was interesting was he, su he suggested that due to possible errors in measuring, he just assumed the value of four instead. So he assumed that the pressure drop was proportional to one over r four, and that again you would need to use experiments in his case to determine what the other con what the other values were. So this q eight n l divided by pi, he would have a different. Um, he would have a actual measured number because he just knew it was proportional to 4.112. And again, he just rounded just to make it because to cover for any errors he thought in measuring, which is pretty interesting. So he got to this R4 by assuming and doing measurements instead of actually uh, formulating them properly, like as concretely as yeah, as Poissel. So again, Poissel, uh, interesting about him, he lived from 1897 to. Actually, whoops, I meant he was born 1797 and uh, died 1869, not, he didn't go back in time. And, uh, anyways, and he was a French physicist and uh, psychologist, and he studied physics and mathematics as, at the Ecole Poly Polytechnique, um, or Polytech Polytechnical School, if you look at it in English, in Paris, and was interested, uh, he was very interested in the, in the flow of human blood in narrow tubes, and in 1838 he experimentally derived and in 1840 and 1846 he formulated and published Poiseuille's law and even gave Hagen credit for determining this me experimentally measured proportional uh, law that, or proportional rule that he uh, determined and uh, which is pretty interesting as well and now the poise after his name is a unit of viscosity in this CGS unit system CGS is the centimeter gram second system of units and, and is a variant of the common metric or SI system and it is based on the centimeter gram second units and most of the units are derived from these base units uh, and just to refresh metric system uses meters kilograms and seconds as base units and these ones use the centimeter GS um, gram and seconds and attempts to introduce Poiseuille as the name for the SI unit P, uh, PAS which is viscosity that's that's our kinetic viscosity, like I explained above, has had little success. And again, SI, or the International System of Units, or System International, is the modern form of the metric system, and both terms are used synony synonymously. Uh, just to get some info on that. Anyways, that is all for today. Hopefully you learned uh, just a little bit of, uh, well, how to derive the amount of a blood flow through a tube or, or a blood vessel or vein etc and they learn from this video and also some uh, some interesting history on mathematics and phys physics and uh, yeah biology etc and also some of about the, the uh, different unit systems out there because yeah this is pretty interesting stuff that has gone on through history anyways that is all for today, and uh, hopefully you learned from this pretty extensive example video, and uh, it's just all over the place in terms of the stuff covered here. And I uh, hope you follow it along. It's a pretty good learning experience. Anyways, that is all for today. If you learn, like always, you can download these exact notes in the link below. And thanks for watching. Stay tuned for another math easy solution.